this is uh, what you call it sociology of religion. religion. I requested Amit to take a class for my paper on Manu Smithy. And in turn, he said that you should take one more class. It's not more like an exchange. You need something in return. The request. Uh, what I intend to do, I have done it incidentally in one of the batches also. I have done the same thing, you know, the same topic for his course. Yes. So the, when he came to me, he said, you know, oh, oh, take a class. I said, oh, what? No, okay, I'll talk about Hindu as religion and Hindu as a culture and then try to understand it. Are you aware of a judgment on Hindu by Supreme Court in relation to People's Representation Act? Hmm? Uh, like certain speeches given during election, whether they are promoting a particular religion or enmity between people. So some people have filed a case in the Supreme Court that the then Supreme Court came out with this ruling that Hindutva is not religion. Hindutva refers to a way of life. That's the judgment. And recently again it was reviewed by a five bench constitutional bench of the Supreme Court. Interestingly, they refuse to revisit that judgment. The people who are expecting it is, I'm talking about one, two months back. So it has been there since the late 90s in this country. So how is it going to be related to your course? This is a sociology of religion. I haven't seen your course outline. I could have located exactly where things could happen. But generally, the two concepts involved here. One is called culture and one is called religion and here is a sociology of religion. There is something called sociology of culture as well. So the fundamental question that we should start is what is the relationship between culture and religion? Uh, are these two terms synonymous or not? What do you understand by this word? What is religion? You must have already done the definition of religion. Tell me. This must have been at least one and a half months old course, right? You must have, I don't believe that you will do a course work on sociology of religion without grappling the very concept of religion at the beginning. What is religion? What do you understand by this word? Theistic system of meaning. Atheistic? Atheistic. Okay, theistic system of meaning. What does it mean? You heard what he said? Okay. Anybody else? Which religion do you belong? No, you have no religion. So is it a fasting statement or an actual event? If somebody writes gender is place of birth, religion, what would you fill in? What do you normally fill in? Hindu religion. So what is religion? You normally in your lived world you distinguish people as this is a Sikh religion, this is Christian, this is Islam, this is Hindu, isn't it? So what is this religion that you are using it here? You are an atheist? You are not. You are not agnostic. The most convenient is get the best of both the worlds. It's like bisexuality, <laughs> agnostic people. <laughs> okay, anybody else want to share what is religion? You have done a course, why are you silent? What is the definition of religion? He has given one. I mean, the kya bola muje At the beginning? Totalizing concept would be even Science is a totalizing concept. Right? It doesn't mean much, huh? I think he has pointed it very clearly one thing. But it is, I would suggest, the very definition that you get is an impact of the cultural turn in social sciences because you are capturing religions within the idioms of cultural studies. That's why you emphasize on the system of meaning. But if I say, does it include the rituals that we come up? 
does it include the artifact of the region, for example, the cross? So there is a material object. There are practices, there are, there are rituals that we kind of associated with them. Everything tends to be reduced to a system of meaning. It has this particularly because of the nature in which we understand culture in business. You, ha you have a religion, you practice a religion, you identify other people as belonging to some other religion other than yours, and yet you are not able to grapple with that. Give that aside. What is culture? When you have a cultural night, hostel, cultural face in the hostel, what do you do? Dance. Singing. You know, this hostel night is cultural face is different. You have a after that you have food, right? Next day. See the one way of looking at these things is always in any concept that you use in social sciences, try to work through your own experiential field as it has been experienced when you use this word in your day-to-day -day life, how people use it, then check the literature and see the traditions within a particular school of thought in social sciences, how these terms are being involved, okay? So by culture in, in our live world, when we do things, it's normally song, dance, poetry, literature, and the kind of dresses that we wear, you have a fashion show, ethnic fashion show, and so on and so forth. So the word culture is normally used in our Lipo to mean these aspects. You know, your songs, the dances, forms, the dresses, and stuff like that. In fact, the sociology of culture, to begin with, would still understand culture in that sense as we, you and I use in day-to-day -day life even today. But it has expanded, one, absolutely, two, Culture is also defined in the earlier text, if you see how it gets evolved, it means a man-made culture. I mean, a gender bias, it could be a human-made culture, you know, environment. So it is an environment created by human beings through certain activity. So if you go in Morgan's theory, for example, that we were, if you remember the evolutionary theory, uh, we were, what first we were Homo erectus, the homo who, who walks straight, and, and what, otherwise we used to walk with four, then we become, we started walking straight, and our hand, if you keep it, it is above your knee. If you look at our close cousin called Chipanji, their hands are below the knee. That's how the homo erectus is. And index finger develop. So what happened is that, in, I'm talking about Morgans, you must have heard about him. Uh, then the index finger develops, so your capacity to manipulate your environment, the tool making stone and so on and so forth, you, you have a particular dexterity through which you started acting upon your environment, which brings about a change in the environment, which in turn shape the way you live things. Huh? You started marking with the cape, you started digging things and you know and making things and so your lifestyle changes. So you can probably call those things as aspects of culture, which is nothing but man-made environment. That's the way people used to define culture. Culture is nothing but the man-made environment. Huh? Uh, whatever is created by the nature is not cultural. Activity. If there is a particular formation of a mountain, you see in some places, people often ask, I don't, I don't remember, is it in Australia or something? You have a stone like this and there's another stone like this. Uh, so people say, that, is it done by somebody else or is it just a natural phenomenon? So you see, if it is done by some people, then it will be a cultural artifact. But if it is happened by nature, then you don't quite consider it as a part of culture. So this is the way you understand the word culture. It is a human-made or human-created environment. As different from environment which is created by nature. It, it, that is one way to look at it. In fact, it is because of this, there is something called a dichotomy. You have a quadrilateral kind of a mapping. And opposite of culture is nature. Opposite of psyche is social. You know, there is a social and psyche, then culture and then nature. Uh, you know, this is culture, nature, debate. You have it. So it is from that. What is natural and what is culture? Culture is a human created environment. That's the, another meaning you have. But then, if you look at it, everything about us is human made, our life. So what political science is studying could also be a subject matter of anthropology. 
right? What sociologists do, what economics do, everything becomes part of sociology. What I mean to suggest is that when the definition, you say man-made environment, you need this could be this could be called the maximalist definition of culture. You get it? It, it is the maximalist definition of culture, which would mean that everything can be fitted. All those things which is associated with human beings can be fitted into that kind of a category. So it's a little problematic. It's almost like if you are aware of uh, Michel Foucault's definition of power, when he dethrone the privilege of the sovereign and you know, when we define the notion of state and power we always see a centralizing figure like from where the power emanates the sovereign entity but for Foucault he, he, he disprivileges that element and he started to say that power is everywhere it, it, it runs in the capillary so to speak then it's every my relationship with you is a power relationship your relationship with your parents is a power relationship so power is everywhere so one of the criticism against Foucault would be that you know, it is two broad definitions that it loses its significance as well so forth. Although I don't agree with this criticism of Foucault, there is another way to defend him. But I'm just giving it, if it is a man-made environment culture, then it becomes a very broad definition. Everything can be fitted into that one. So what is culture? Then people started looking at the narrowed down aspects of it. That which is associated with certain belief systems and value orientation. These are the, another way of looking at culture. It is about beliefs and it is the value orientations in a given society or a collective. It, it, now, the definition has shifted from a main middle, which is quite a maximalist, universalist kind of outlook, that it is trying to narrow down the scope of this definition by saying that culture refers to a value orientations of a collective, their belief systems, and so on and so forth. Then the, the usual aspects of the artifact about clothing and so forth used to be part of that. That's how the anthropology moved in the definition of culture. Huh? Uh, this belief systems, value orientations, and it, from that comes the contemporary idea, which is what you have alluded when you define religion, a system of meaning. A semiotic system, for example, and people like Clifford Gears would be associated with this one. So culture is defined not so much, obviously, in terms of materiality of our life, but rather as a system of meanings and symbols. So it is a semiotic system. That's how, and that is why, if you understand ethnography, for example, when you open a methodology book in the contemporary research method books, you will probably find that saying that ethnography is a qualitative research method. Isn't it? And most people tend to talk about it. Uh, the, um, the problem with that kind of an outlook, while well, you can still understand, is that if you look at the classic studies of ethnography before, they use sampling design, they use quantitative methods, and so on and so forth. All classic ethnographic works in the 1940s or the 30s, they use quantitative methods. And there are debates on whether the idea of sample, for example, is a legitimate concern for ethnographic work. Now, these terms like in, uh, statistical analysis, counting number, comparing, and then you know, whether your sampling design was okay with when you do ethnography and all this stuff, uh, do not sound intelligible today because you said that ethnography is qualitative matter. But you know that the ethnographic work in the earlier times, have all those issues of quantitative results. Why is that we are saying ethnography is qualitative today? It is precisely because of the shift in the meaning of culture. You see, anthropologists study culture, but the meaning have of the of the word culture has changed. Today, culture would mean a system, a semiotic system. It is of uh, it is of meanings and symbols. And therefore, if you define culture as meanings and symbols, obviously, when you deal with meanings and symbols, you are using qualitative method. So it is a historically very specific meaning when you say ethnography is a qualitative method. It is a contemporary meaning of that one. You cannot generalize it. Am I making sense? Because in certain point in time, when anthropologists define culture, it was not merely a system of meaning. It was much more than what we understand by meaning. But you should also remember that post-1960s in social sciences, we have something called post-structural turn, huh? where where you say that, you know, uh, in, in a way, what 
does not simply represent reality, but it, it, it constitutes reality. The very moment we deploy a word, the act of speaking is, is part of uh, a social transaction. It is also a form of power relationship. It also constitutes a power relations and what the world is. What was I talking about? I was talking about the system huh? or structuralist. So I was saying that because of that, that, the language is constitutive of reality. So the centrality of language becomes very crucial in social sciences. You from which place? I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> it is the friend's delight, I, I would suggest it. All this post-structuralism and this people started with this intellectual in France. You know, uh, there is this uh, a, a sociologist from Norway, Johan Galtu. Uh, you know, he, he often suggests that, you know, if how he, he describes something called intellectual traditions uh, across the globe. And one of the models he gave was this um, British English Anglo Saxon model of intellectual style and Gallic style and so on. So, <clears throat> for the Anglo Saxon model, he said, How do we discuss the truthfulness of a proposition? He says, The principal idea or the foundation of that argument would be what are the documentary evidences that you have? But if it is in French intellectual traditions, how do we judge the validity or the worth? of a proposition, it says, how do we define the word? That's why I said post-structuralism uh, post is a friend's delight. That is the preponderance of friend's intellectual tradition. It's about words. I often say that some of you have heard me saying this. It's always words, words that all that I have. You remember that Boy John's story? That song is that words, words. Psychoanalysis, word in, in Bible, in Genesis, at the beginning there was war, and God, war was with God, and what? And war is God at the end of the day. And Sigmund Freud pops up in our history and says that it's you know it's not a disease of the brain. It, it is uh, though it, the term neurosis still got stuck initially. They thought it had something to do with our neurons. That's why neuro neurosis is the, is the problem of the neurons. But they later on started saying that it's about words, it's about meanings, about psyche and so on. It's independent of that. So it's talking therapy, it's psychotherapy. Not the physical therapy, but it's psychotherapy means talking therapy. You talk. So words is very important. And word is not only about what I'm speaking. You know that's in symbolic interactionism, if you look at in your sociological tradition, the gesture is part of language. We stress the meaning of the language to include the body language and so on and so forth. Uh, that's you must have already done in your symbolic interaction. So this is words and meanings and symbols. And then culture becomes, so their contemporary uses is, is predominantly. So culture is a system of semiotic, a semiotic system that is about meanings and words. So what you said about religion, you said it is a theistic system of meaning, right? So that is religion. So we'll come to what religion is. But by the way, when I speak about it, but you can look at certain traditions where culture is being studied in sociology and anthropology. There are other ways of looking at it. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with a uh, system of meaning, doesn't mean it's only about words. For example, in Bourdieu's term, if you look at religious capital, it is it is he's talking about power relationship. It's the relation of power as you use. It's, it's a symbol that you deploy, and in the act of deploying the symbols, there is also a particular kind of uh, social relations or power relationship is being enacted. So there are other schools where system of meaning doesn't simply mean the meaning. Or or if you are familiar with a uh, very well known essay by Clifford Pierce called Balini Scope Fight, for example, it's not fight of two folks as such. But you know, if you decipher the entire range of that particular phenomenon, he is trying to extract what is to be a Balinese. It is codified in that particular act. So it's not about Coke fight, but it's about what is to be a Balinese you can decipher uh, from that particular 
uh, no phenomenon that no watch. So in the system of meaning in the semiotic system, you should simply think about dictionary in the sense of no, what does it mean kind of thing. No? It means a lot. Uh, it's not only uh, it's talking about power relation, you can do it, what what kind of word you allow. So the, when you started analyzing this kind of thing, why did I mention about post-structuralism is because all uh, other methods associated with this, like discursive analysis, discourse analysis. When you write, I don't know your generation, you might not have written letters like this, but when I was in school, if I want to take a tutti off day from my school, then I write, you know, I have the honor to state your back, huh? and you end your letter by saying yours faithfully. This is, this language is indicative of the power relationship. Okay, so language doesn't simply mean words and meaning it, it, it talks about them. Or if I take, for example, if you're doing a, a qualitative study and say the teacher is shouting at a student saying they don't behave like a monkey. I mean, it's a simple utterance, but you know, it speaks about my ideological position and that particular word itself defines what is to be in a classroom, what is to uh, what is to be a student, what is to be a teacher, because you know, monkey is what? Naughty in discipline, so classroom is about discipline, and there is somebody who discipline and uh, being disciplined. So, you know, in this simple sentence called don't behave like monkey, you can decipher the meaning of classroom, what is what is to be, uh, what is what is the meaning of classroom, what is to be a student, what is to be a teacher, what is the power relationship between the two, even from this simple sentence. That's how the qualitative studies us. Though, more often than not, my experience tells me you know, over the years that Qualitative method has become an alibi for one's own incompetence in research method, particularly quantitative, and everything and everything goes in the name of qualitative studies. I'm just giving you the exciting aspects of qualitative research. But in practice, what I've seen is that everything and everything goes. That's not done. Huh? Just to remind you that you will be excited because you know I'm not going to deal with statistics. In fact, statistics is much more simpler and then you know it's easier to defend your work. And one of your founding fathers, called Drukheim, had always dreamed about statistically rooted sociology. But in India, it takes a very different turn. Huh? But Durkheim still finds his place in sociological introduction everywhere. Does it happen in Italy? In Ireland. Sorry, Ireland. Does it happen? Do you know in India, how long have you been here? Uh, since the start of January. Hmm? Just since the start of January. Okay, January. In India, we have something called Trinity. Mm -hmm. in, in the Hindu the Godheads. Mm -hmm. So you have Marx. <laughs> Is that the Trinity of India? You will be shot down, man. <laughs> be careful about that. He's uh, right. I mean, it's the Trinity of sociology. I don't know who's the destroyer, who's the preserver, who's the creator, though. But I can definitely say Durkheim was the creator because his book, especially Rule, is described by many commentators as a manifesto of a discipline, just as communist manifesto. Uh, he, he went on to design the discipline. So. But Marx is being co opted. I don't think Marx have ever described himself as a sociologist. And Weber, he, in the same essay, will define himself as so many things. As a political economist, kind of thing, he will start his lecture, but in between he say, you know what we need to do as a sociology here? Check his um, sciences vocation. And this is like um, politics as vocation. In the same lecture, he will define himself as a political economist. economist. Then uh, sociologist, all, all this thing comes in Weber's idea. Durkheim, very clear. I'm going to create a discipline called sociology. So I am sociologist in that sense. He was very clear. So he was definitely creator. I don't know who the destroyer among the other two. Is a, uh, these three peoples have also different ways of looking at religion. Huh? And very quickly, I, for, for Durkheim, obviously, it's about social fact. Something that impinges on your behavior, control that goes beyond individual and so on. For Marx, it is ideology. Huh? It's, it's a part of your false consciousness, <coughs> part of the superstructures and so on. Huh? 
but there are deviating within this particular theoretical schools where that um, culture is to be looked uh, as, as having certain kind of autonomy, and especially in historiography, these debates exist, or, or it's to be reducible to the material economic processes and so on. This has been debated before. Bodio, for example, he would insist that these distinctions, you know, watertight compartment is unacceptable to Bodio and so on. So what I'm saying is that different school of thought, different theories have different ways of looking at these phenomena. But what is critical in his definition, which is what you can, that you understand why did I say that it is uh, shaped by the cultural turn in sociology, because you begin to define it as a system of meaning, otherwise you won't. Huh? Uh, the most crucial part of the definition of religion is the debate around the first word that you have used, theistic. Does it involve a particular figure of Godhead God, some spiritual things, and centered around that, you know, certain kind of worldviews and practices around that, and that's what we call the religion in that terms. Huh? You understand? There is something like a personalized God. Uh, if you remember, if you can sense this, what I mean by personalized, in Kantian distinction of theological, metaphysics, and positive. You remember that three phases in which are evolution of mind, what did he mean by theological? We understand world. The first phase was theological. It is why you attribute certain things of the, the things that happen in nature to a very personalized spirit or God. You know, and I've given this example often in my class when I say, you know, you are drenched with rain and there is big flash with a sound. Uh, Lord Indra is trying to take a snap of your ears, you know, you know you're dancing in the rain and you wanted to have a good grab. The sound that you hear is because his camera is too big. That's why that sound is loud to everything. What am I doing? I'm just explaining uh, lightning by attributing something to some personalized being, right? That's what theological explanation is. You know why the, there is um, uh, solar eclipse or you know maybe that somebody has eaten it Hanuman has kept it here so you explain by attributing to certain that form of knowledge is what Kant was referring to as theological phase of understanding the world right so it is that what is he meant by when he says a theistic system of meaning so there is a figure of a god or some spirit some personalized spirit, right? So all these things is essential. But then people started saying that, is it necessary conditions to define what constitutes religion? What happened to Buddhism? You know about Buddha? Does he believe in God? Does Buddhism believe in God? There, was, there are segments in that. Hmm? There's a story about this one, you know, there was... Is get the idea of what Buddhism has as another, okay. which is which is what I'm going to uh, take you to the the little part, the the aspects that I have said about uh, Hindu and others. I'll come back to that later. There's a story about you know this. Um, um, we call him now Bhagwan Buddha or Lord Buddha. He was meditating, you know, very calm, smiling face, closed his eyes, and he was relaxed and doing meditation. And one of his disciples was doing it besides him, meditating. And a very agitated gentleman came and started waking him up and Master, you tell me, did you tell that guy that God exists? He was breaking that, you know, God exists, and you have said it, you have agreed. Why did you say, answer me to Buddha didn't answer, he was made. This guy said, don't preach wrong things. I respect you. God doesn't exist. See, you might say that God exists by saying this, but then, you know, he started giving counter on himself. So he just completely de you know, destroyed the idea of existence of God. And triumphantly, he turns to Buddha and says, see, you have no answers. So don't preach. So he walked triumphantly. The disciple was... Very impressed with the argument that God doesn't exist. So he was very curious. Just as he was about to ask the Buddha about what, what is, the, is this guy so convincing kind of thing, huh? another guy came rushing in, very angry. And did you say that God doesn't exist? 
to him, he was again bringing that God doesn't exist. Then he started giving counter arguments to him. Okay? So Buddha didn't say any word again. Okay? And he also said the same thing. So don't dare to preach wrong thing. Okay, God exists. You have no answer. So he walked out. The disciple was utterly, utterly confused now because he said, you know, both these guys are so convincing. So he said, Master, both are so reasonably, you know, I'm completely confused. Tell me what is the truth. Buddha continued to meditate with that calm smile. And after some time, the disciple looked at him, he started smiling, that his anxiety is over. You know which one is true. That anxiety is gone, he also started smiling and closed his eyes and continued meditating. And he said, Master, I have understood it. So what did the disciple, like it was my, what did the uh, disciple under, uh, understand? This, this particular anecdote is, is a peculiar nature of uh, uh, Buddhist take on existence of God. This, this uh, anecdote that I've shared with you. In Western philosophy, it is reflected in Kantian anomalies. You see that he said there are certain things which you can rationally argue both for, for or against. And Kant also talks about it in Western philosophical tradition. So that's Buddhism. There's no commitment to godly things, right? So in that case, if you think that it is a theistic, of course the followers have started attributing something to Buddha by putting his idol and so on, but the religion itself is non-committal in one level on the very existence of God. So is the very figurehead of God essential category to define what constitutes religion? That's the issue. So some issues like Buddhism will um, uh, problematize the idea of what you have just said. Huh? But I said it, the theistic element by the practices attributes to Buddha. Am I making sense? Before I continue, just mark this word. The practices attributed. You understood this one? Okay. So I've already problematized two aspects of it. I'm taking his definition, what he said, religion is the theistic system of meaning, right? Huh? And I said this theistic means there is something like a godly figure. So, I mean, rituals and belief systems around that is what we define what religion is in its definition. Then I have raised this question whether it is essential for you to have the figure of a god or a personalized spirit or soul to define what constitutes religion. Now, as a counterpoint to that one, I gave the example of Buddhism. Am I making sense now? Okay, then he poses a question, which actually is what I was about to come to that. Um, in the Western countries, Buddhism is uh, talked about more of a philosophy, a philosophical thought, rather than religion as such. Okay. That brings us back to the question of so what religion is. The idea that we understand in anthropological debates in social sciences is that the very concept of uh, religion is heavily, heavily influenced by the manner in which we understand Christianity and Islam. Religion, it is what Islam or Christianity is. You have a holy book, you have certain rituals around certain figure, I mean, institutionalized forms, and so on and so forth. And that is what we call religion. So there's a known debate in anthropology. You just said the very idea that anthropology, you think that it is a secular intellectual enterprise and it has a category called religion. But that uh, idea of religion is informed by the West. Am I making sense? So this brings us back to the all social sciences debate in this part of the world. And uh, that all our knowledge and conceptual categories are in some sense derivative from the Western experience. Nation, for example, as Nandi will call that it is a European concept which came riding piggyback on colonial expansion. So it's an alien. Tagore, for example, have never translated this word nation whenever he writes in Bengali or in any other languages. He will always write a nation, just to underline the fact that the idea of nation is alien to this part of the world. Am I making sense? The idea of history, the idea of sociology, the idea of political science, Ashish Nandi called, these are package delivery from the West. You know, it has evolved in a particular context in these disciplines and it is transferred. So the debate has been that most of what we have, the categories, 
are derived from a particular experience in the world. This has been part of an intellectual debate that you should be aware of it in social sciences, derivative discourse. Huh? Uh, the idea is it derivative discourse? Is there something specific about Indian, uh, about these categories? Take, for example, Pathos Epizemi, remind us that there is a distinction between, in the literary criticism, between play and novel and play. Huh? Playwright and novelist, so the, the art product, the cultural product called the novel and the play. These are two different distinctions in the analytical literary criticism and categories. But Pastor said they started asking these questions like in the later part of the 19th century, or even for that matter, in, in the uh, you know in the 19th century, for example, literature produced in Bengal, you will have a confusion whether this particular genre of literature is actually uh, a play or a novel. It doesn't quite fit to this analytical category. Am I making sense? So it is part of that problem for us in the sense that the understanding that we have about religion as a secular category in anthropology, which is an intellectual tradition, the religion that you have as a part of sociology of religion, you think that it is uh, a secular intellectual category. Okay. But the manner in which this concept is being understood by this same secular uh, you know, enterprise like sociology or anthropology is in, in fact informed by Christianity and Islam. So you have it. So when the Western people came here, India also tried to mimic those rituals and produce. So you know, court practices, if you see in the court of law in India, just as you place your hand on the Bible or Quran, then you know Hindus started doing on Bhagavad Gita, which is the actually the part of this epic called Mahabharata. 11th chapter is part of Mahabharata's story, Gita. When uh, Arjuna crumbled, he couldn't perform his duty as a Kshatriya because he said, how can I fight with my uncle, my teacher, my cousins, and so on. And Krishna was trying to explain, no, these, these are not your cousins, these are my old souls, and you are all kind of things. Like an Adamant chap, he keep on questioning, keep on questioning. And then Krishna displayed what is called Vishwarama, Vishwaru. So that and then you know, then Gita described how Arjuna was shaken in perspiration coming in, and he saw that all good, evil, bad, everything is part of me. So sort of huh? uh, that's in Gita. So what we do if they have Bible, if they have this, okay, let's also have it. So. Gita big heart rate kind of thing, no? Bollywood culture and populace and also it reproduces that one. So what you actually see here is that Hinduism is become something like a book-based religion. But for the way you call him this, for some, Ram Charitramanas by Tulsidas is a holy book. Many people keep it in their houses. So you know this book-based kind of thing. Uh, uh, it's become a letter development, so we mimic in, in the image. If, if, if in Bible people say that you know, God created human beings in his own image, right? In, in my own mother tongue, uh, that is what me, me and me is the same, you know, the shadow and the human being. So we are crafted out of the shadow of the creator kind of thing. This is there in manipulated literature. Uh, so in the eyes of the Europe, we create ourselves that we have a history, we have a nationhood, we have a religion, and so on and so forth. And the, the fact that this is the, the Christian or Islam-centric understanding of religion is true. That I have just given you an example of a ritual placing the hand on, 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 on the book. It's a book-based religion sort of thing, right? The other thing that you instantly recognize, if you are a little alert to that, when we describe what is called religion across the world, you have ism, except Islam and Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Zoroastrianism, you know, Shintoism, Confucianism. No? So it is an ism, not in the sense of Marxist sense of uh, an ideology, but rather in terms of a thought, a worldview. That's why in American universities, you will find in the Department of Philosophy or South Asian thought, rather than in the department of religion or so. Am I making sense? They are right in that sense. That is why in the West, Buddhism is considered as part of thought. It's not only Buddhism. All of these things have an element of being an ism. You don't say Islamism. It's people started using it because of a particular environment, but hardly you say about Christianism. 
Mm. So that, that is the, uh, the basic foundation of the concept of religion that you have. Am I making sense now? Let's see the relationship between the two. What is the relationship between the two? If you say the Bible festival, is it a cultural festival or is it a religious festival? Cultural. Huh? Cultural. Cultural? It's both. It's like him, agnostic, and taking this, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I always remember that song of Mumbo number five. Yeah. You see? Uh, a little bit of everything has become what? So culture has become a little bit of everything of which religion can come as one of them. That's why you said. So we have, is the 25th December a religious or cultural festival? Culture. Hmm? It's more of a consumer festival. That's true. Very good answer. I like it. Valentine Day is not so much about love between a boy or a girl. It's about buying and selling of gifts. It's a commercial enterprise for you to buy. People said, you know, as if you don't give a, you, you don't get a card from your boyfriend or girlfriend on Valentine Day, you started suspecting him or her, right? <laughs> and that's that, that the capitalist industrial complex makes you sure that you have like that. You remember, I remember one of these things. It, how cultural product sales is kind of an ideological project, you know, Akshay Kumar and uh, Somebody on the head. It's about thumbs up or Coca Cola. I don't remember now. Is it? I know the Purana. Sorry, it's an old Indian singer called K L Singer, who can actually sing beautifully like a lullaby, and you sleep. Okay, so he was singing like Dilhi Tutga something something or Soja Ras Kumari kind of thing. Then comes the loud Western music. You know this. A caustic drum plucking the guitar, and then Akshay Kumar came with his knee cave and you know, slide on the thing. The music changed into loud Western music. Then Coca Cola comes and he drinks it. Now, what does it mean? That simply consuming a cold drink, Naito chicken ji pee sakte the, not to uh, quench yourself, but you know, you are being encouraged to consume something, and that consumption does not simply come. Uh, the, uh, along with the food item, but it comes with a cultural component. If if you if you are romantic about it, you say you don't have time, you know, to appreciate that one, you know. So it could be very. I don't want to sing those songs. There are particular kind of songs that it is the form in which love is being expressed. So what I'm saying that these are cultural things, but it, it impinges on economic life. Political aspects, ideological aspects. There are intersectionalities between the two. Am I making sense? So many of the things we can understand in twofold manners. Therefore, the first is that there is sometimes religion as culture. You will see in literatures people will talk about it. Why some people still try to distinguish religion and culture are two different things. Because. By and large, even though it was problematic of the theistic element that you have mentioned, culture is not about, it is not solely about that theistic aspects of it. Right? So culture is a much more broader concept than religion. Religion is a slightly more narrower kind of things. But do they form part of the same complex, the complex whole of our symbolic system? that you will encounter when you study the distinction between the two. My last part, which I'm going to give you and end enough with uh, John L. Meru, is on the idea of Hindu, and it is here. This desire to distinguish between culture and religion comes from, this is my reading, okay? Uh, partly can also be intelligible to us because of what can be called increasing secularizations of our life. Okay. Uh, there is a book by uh, Achin Vinayak. Did I give you this thing on that four typologies? Uh, it's, it's in that book so you can see how secularization has happened in our life. Simple terms, marriage, birth, death, every ritual is tied to a religious things. 
Republic as the or Valentine Day or somebody says a commercial. Otherwise, you know, in the truly devout people when they celebrate Dipavli, it's normally they do that evening prayer and you want to get rid, so Lakshmi should come to your house. There's a particular timing in which you should placate with her and so on. There is a devout uh, devotional aspects of, of the practice. But for us, it's light colors, eating, gift. You see what happening is that it is detached from any it, you know element of godly things. It has been sort of marginalized. It, it's not completely done away with, but it has been marginalized. Anything to do with the godly thing has been marginalized. The Bible is more of commercial about give, about showing off your thing, or even a moment to communicate your feelings to the other. Lakshmi never said that you should communicate your feeling of love to a man or a woman. You know, the probably could be an occasion, not Valentine's Day, if you give her a nice gift and you go out for a date in the morning and stuff like that. So for them, the probably has become an occasion like that. It's not completely a religious in the sense it is attached to a figure of a goddess called Lakshmi. Am I making sense? That's what I mean by increasing secularization of our, of our life. Many of our rituals have been increasingly detached from religion. Teaching, take for example, in the Gurukul system in the olden times, would have started with Saraswati Vandana. Do your teachers come in the class and start? They don't, do they? That's a, how many practices that we do is being detached from religious elements. So in that sense, you can see that this desire to distinguish between these two is, is also partly occasioned by the increasing secularization of our public, our, our lives. It is a relationship between religion, culture, and politics. The institutional context within which these elements exist. Huh? You need to understand, and that is why this desire to distinguish between uh, culture and religion takes shape. It is particularly in relationship with a political project and so on. So for this, what I will tell you is about Bharat Mata and India. The idea of India came up, you know, with different kind of kings and you know, different kinds of people. So the British brought these people together. I'm cutting a long story short. Then what happened is that the nationalist leaders, they learn Western theories, Western educations. So Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay started saying that we must have a history. So, you know, and then people like Bipan Chandrapal and Staris, is that what you call, uh, you know, this nationalist leader of the 19th century and so on, they started saying that what you call India is an old country and we had our own name called Bharat Varsha, you know, and the, the land of sons and the, uh, the progenies of Bharata. They, they started articulating, so we should have, we are a nation who says, since then they started, you know, in the Hegelian sense of the word, the non-Europe is people without history. They are primitive. They are the subject matter of anthropology, right? They are outside the realm of history. Even if you read Benedict Anderson's work, there's something called homogeneous time, a particular notion of time. You inhibit within that as a civilized. Hegelian understanding of progression of human society is also their part of that. Once you inhabit, you are a subject who inhabit in that domain of history or of the uh, uh, this time frame, then you become part of modernity and you know the rest of the people are outside of those frame and they are primitive people. Anthropology is for primitive people and history for the civilized, sociology is for the civilized people. It still continues. If you go to abroad and in all likelihood you will be, if you are registering, you will be forced to register in the anthropology department rather than the sociology department in the United States. There's a lovely lecture in Cambridge or Oxford by Andrew Bate on this. It is available on YouTube on this nature of anthropology and sociology in the West. And yes, it's there also. I've read that text, I've seen it uh, also. Okay, so it's a relationship between political context. Uh, this is this also occasioned the necessity to distinguish between the two. Take for example, so India, from being a people without history, as a non-Europe, these guys started asserting that we have a history, we have a civilization, okay? So Nehru articulates that all nationalists said we have 5,000 years old civilization. So in the history writing, as Sanjay Shubramanian points out, uh, civilization becomes the axis through which we write our history, through which we make ourselves visible. We were invisible in the Western epistemological framework because we are outside civilization, we are primitive, we are outside that modern time frame. 
But we become intelligible precisely because we started asserting that we have a history, we are a nation, we have a civilization, and so on and so forth. All those things you can see how we imagine through the prism of these Western categories. Since then, in what happened is from the Indus, Indic, you have this in the creation of the new religious concept called Hinduism. There is overlapping because the idea, practice, philosophy is more or less the same. The Vedantic philosophy is what is being reproduced in some sense in the uh, in Bhagavad Gita, you know, about the soul, about spirit, about knowledge, and so on. So the philosophy in the Western and religious thought get collapses in, in that sense. Much of our philosophical traditions come from there. And then Hindu and Muslim becomes another category through which the British is trying to exploit. So for the nationalists, it was crucial, crucial for them to distinguish Hindu as a religion and Hindu as a way of life. And this is a classic example about what I said. The desire to distinguish religion from culture is occasioned by the political context within which they exist. I'm going to read out a certain uh, paragraph uh, from uh, Nehru's own work, okay? He says, I'm reading two paragraphs before I end this lecture. He said, Hinduism as a faith is vague amorphous, many-sided, all things to all men. It is hardly possible to define it or end it to say definitely whether it is a religion or not in the usual sense of the word. In its present form and even in the past, it embraces many beliefs and practices from the highest to the lowest, often opposed to and contradicting each other. It is, its essential spirit seems to be to leave and let leave. This is something that people say we are very accommodated and so on. Even Nehru has that idea. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, has, has attempted to define it, Hinduism. And this is his word, Gandhi's word. He says, if I were asked to define Hindu creed, I would simply say, search after truth through non-violent means. A man may not believe in God and still call himself a Hindu. Hinduism is relentless pursuit of the truth. Hinduism is the religion of truth. Truth is God, denial of God we have known. Denial of truth we have not known, unquote. The Nehru comments, said, truth and non-violence, so says Gandhi understands it, is no essential part of Hindu creed. This is Nehru started commenting on that. And we thus have truth left by itself as a distinguishing mark of Hinduism. And that, of course, is not definition at all. That is Nehru's take on Gandhi's approach. And the political context is here, which is I've quoted in some of my articles um, before. He said, it is therefore incorrect and in, under, undesirable to use Hindu or Hinduism for Indian culture. Even with reference to the distant past, although the various aspects of thought as embodied in ancient writings were the dominant expression of that culture, much more is it incorrect to use those terms in that sense today. See, there is a contextualized analysis. Hindu did not have the meaning that you and I understand. It comes from sin, the word. Okay? The way Persian uses it, it is around this in this very area. So that's the name of a place and people who live there, it has no religious meaning. And that's why Jahapna of Hindustan, that's how uh, Akbar would be defined by themselves in their literatures. Okay. So that uh, to use in that sense would be wrong is what Nehru said. For me, the later part is what very interesting in my writings I have quoted before. Much more is incorrect to use and today. Okay, so long as the old faith, this is the line I started quoting in my article called Indica to Bharat via India. And this is the line that I said, so long as the old faith and philosophy were chiefly a way of life. You have to remember that culture as a way of life? Huh? Uh, and an outlook on the world, the world view. Okay. They were largely synonymous with Indian culture. Okay. But when a more rigid religion developed with all manner of ritual and ceremonials, this is what the typical Christian bloated definition of religion. Okay? It became something more at the same time, something much less than the composite culture. And this is the astounding comment that Nehru made. He says the Christian 
or a Muslim could and often did adapt himself to the Indian way of life and culture and yet remain in faith in Orthodox Christian and Muslim. He had Indianized himself and become an Indian without changing his religion and go. This is what I have discussed. He's saying that Hinduism as culture is bigger in a ceremony than it become, you know, it's it's coterminous with a larger composite culture. But the end, did you see it says that the Muslim or Christians adapt, the world is adapt to the Indian way of life. Huh? And um, Indianize, Indianize themselves. Uh, a Hindu doesn't require to adapt to the Indian ways of life. If it, if, while he was still arguing in the other parts of the book that it has elements from Persia, it has elements from Greek, and so many things Indian culture is a composite. If it is that, a Hindu should also have been adapted to that way of life. But he, he you know, it's what I call it a Freudian slip on the Hindu spot. He only mentioned about Christian and in the Hindus. So there is an essential, that's a debate that I started with, remember, the idea of Hindutva in Supreme Court judgment. These are the background to concept of religion, concept of uh, cultures and Hindu as a concept, how it was a geographical. All these things will have it. In the West too, remember that when you discuss Sunni Mayalas coming for you, there is what is called secularization of a theological concepts. What used to be associated with religion is divested of the religious meaning. For example, Bindi. I remember a very well-known Indian politician. I don't know whether she is still around in Parliament. was very old. Who was there with Rajiv Gandhi when he died? Margaret Alva. It's a very really speaker or something. If you see her face, I remember one of our interviews. She wears a big Bindi here, and she is a Christian. In Canada, a racist used to attack Indians in Canada. That gang's name is called Dot Busters. You know, for them, it's an Indio. You know, that's very nasty. You know, Indio, like Hindu, you know, for them, that kind of thing. So this becomes a sign of that. In India, this doesn't become a sign of whether you are a Hindu or so. When Margaret Alpha was asked, you were a devout Christian, but you are wearing bindi. So he said, this is what the Indian women do. I'm a Christian. So this is, this is bindi. Divested of the religious man. You know this is Sivji's third eye. But he doesn't have that. Bengali women are known for keeping cues. Nice, uh, Rajri, you didn't try it out? <laughs> okay. It's a peculiar Bengali, you can see. I, if I see, it's typical, I can figure it out. This, this girl is quite, quite likely to be a Bengali. You know? But they have a particular way of wearing sari, and this bindi is a marker of that one. That was Shivsi's third eye, but it has been divested of the religious meaning. That was what uh, Margaret Alva says. But the point, as I say, how these distinctions operate within the political context, these are all available part of your studies on sociology of religions. And I would like you to look at different theories and the context within which I've said. Thank you so much for listening.